Gerald Edward Levert was born on July 13, 1966, to his mother, Martha Levert, and his father, Eddie Levert. Now, his dad was the lead singer of the legendary R&B group, the OJs, and they had songs like Love's Train, Stairway to Heaven, Backstabbers, I mean, you can go on and on, they got a catalog, and they're definitely legends. So Gerald, you know, he grew up around this, you know, he had a nice life. They grew up in the suburbs of Cleveland and he was always around his dad and his band. Matter of fact, he used to travel with him a lot, you know, so eventually Gerald ended up getting that bug, that musical bug. He wanted to be like his dad, you know, and at first his dad would kind of like shy away from it. Like he didn't really want him to be a part of the music industry. He wanted him to just go to college and, you know, have a normal type of life. But Gerald was persistent with it. So eventually his dad kind of gave in and started helping Gerald with his musical aspirations. He started like uh, getting them um, drums and things like that, different musical instruments. And eventually he ended up buying him a piano, you know, but but Gerald, he ain't like the piano, man. He, he really wasn't feeling that. But see, something came into their life that that filled that void of needing somebody who loved instruments. And that was somebody by the name of Mark Gordon. And a lot of people thought that he was like their cousin because he lived with them for a long time. But actually, he was just somebody that they knew from the Jehovah's Witness Church. Like the Levert family, they were they were devout Jehovah's Witnesses. So he knew him from there. And Mark, he loved to play instruments so he stepped into the um in the gerald's life and you know they just began to make music together along with gerald's brother sean now see sean he 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 liked music and he had a great voice as well but he didn't have a passion like gerald had you know he was kind of just doing it like hey my brother want to do music so hey i want to do music so all three of them got together and would just write songs and come up with different melodies and things like that. And Gerald would still go to his dad and say, hey, man, won't you help me, you know, get in the music industry? But his dad would turn him away a lot of times because he, he didn't feel like they was ready. You know, and then Gerald, you know, he said he would play music for his dad and his dad would just be like, nah, that ain't it. You know, and that was going on for a long time. And eventually it got to the point where Gerald Nim did make some good music. And they bought it to their dad and he was like, OK, you know, I can work with this. And his dad, he started, you know, he started grinding for his son like he was trying to use all his industry connections to land his son a deal. But see, they had a problem. And that problem was a lot of people felt like Gerald sounded too much like his dad. Like I said, he was the lead singer of the OJ. So he has a very known voice. So a lot of people would hear Gerald and be like, wait a minute, that's you, you know, and they would say, we don't need another Eddie Levert. They didn't feel like Gerald's voice, you know, had its own identity. So after a while of going around to different record companies and coming into the same problem of them feeling like Gerald didn't have his own voice, he eventually went back to Philly International, like Philadelphia International Records. That was Eddie Levert's and the OJ's home label, the label where they made a lot of their hits. And he used his connections there to get Gerald Levert his first record deal. And that was in 1985 when they got a deal with Tempera Records. And they released an album called I Get Hot. But it was through like a local label. They really didn't have much of a push, so it didn't make a lot of noise. But that would all change when the group was able to leave the small label and sign with a major label in Atlantic Records. And this is when they had their first number one hit with the song pop 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 goes my mind i actually like that song man it's one of my jams and you know this, this kind of put them on the map you know so people started taking notice of levert and they followed that up with the 1987 album the big throwdown and this one came became an even bigger hit because they had the song casanova you know and that song kind of had like a a pop appeal to it you know so it went number one in the u.s and in the uk it was in the top 10 so now the group levert they were worldwide you know and another thing people may not know is uh the movie new jack city um when they had the groups singing around the trash cans during like the transitions of the scenes 
like it was two groups one of them was troop and one of them was lavert so if you ever get a chance to go back and watch new jack city that was them singing around that trash can but anyways uh lavert man they kept it rolling you know and they came out with another album in 1988 called just cooling and it had, it had a single on there with the same name just cooling and it was featuring um heavy d and and crazy as it sounds that was heavy d's only number one number one song and heavy d we we know he was big time back in the day you know matter of fact i think i might do a story on heavy d man yeah i can't believe he only had one number one but yeah they released just cooling you know and they end up winning a soul train award for a favorite group and you know they was rolling they was doing their thing but Eventually, Gerald started getting that solo itch, man. He he wanted to do his own thing. You know, he people started to tell him he was too big for the group setting. And this would cause friction between him and his fellow bandmate, Mark Gordon, who, you know, was pretty much like his brother since they had spent so much time together, knew each other from church with the Jehovah's Witness and everything. You know, Mark kind of said in, in interviews that he felt like Gerald pretty much abandoned the group, you know, and because when Gerald left, his brother Sean didn't want to do the group no more. Because like when I said previously, um, Sean, like he could sing, but he wasn't as passionate about it as Gerald. And once Gerald left, he was like, well, hey, my brother ain't doing it. I ain't doing it, you know, and Mark Gordon and Gerald Levert, they didn't talk for years after this, man. And even though it hurt Gerald to leave behind his brother's I mean, he, you know, he wanted to be a solo artist. He wanted that solo stardom. So he had to do what he had to do, you know, and even before he actually left, he had already kind of started branching off. He, he started to get into production. He was working with groups like Men at Large, The Rude Boys, I mean, Patti LaBelle. I mean, he, he produced Teddy Pendergrass. So he was already kind of starting to branch off and he was doing a lot of duets with a singer by the name of Mickey Howard. Yeah, they, they had a lot of uh, chemistry between each other on songs, but that's because him and Mickey had a real relationship, you know, in real life. And they was very passionate and they loved each other a lot. But according to Mickey Howard, she they wanted her to become a Jehovah's Witness. And she said she was not with that. And Gerald LeVert was like, well, if you're not going to become a, Je a Jehovah's Witness, then we, we can't be together. So they continued to make music. But as far as the actual item, it was a wrap for that. But Gerald kept going along with his solo career and he, he was having success. Matter of fact, he had a number one record with his dad called Baby Hold On To Me. And his dad, by this point, man, that was like in the early 90s. So by this point, his dad was like known as a legend. But... I mean, it, it had been a minute since the OJs had a hit. So he was kind of reintroducing his dad to the new generation as well. So he, he was making hits all over the place. And all throughout the 90s, he had the song uh, Thinking About It. He had the song Take Everything, Mr. Too Damn Good to You. I mean, he, he, he was rolling. You know, Gerald was doing his thing and a lot of platinum, a lot of gold a lot of success and in the year 2000 Gerald released an album called G and this was the album that had that song Mr. Too Damn Good to You on there and um yeah it ended up going gold so it was another success for Gerald but after this it's kind of like the hits just dried up because he never had an album that went gold or platinum again I mean from the years 2001 up to 2004 he released albums but None of them ever really made any noise, you know, and Gerald found himself competing with artists like Usher and Justin Timberlake, that pop sound that was super popular in the early 2000s. And according to his family, like his label began to tell him things like he was too fat and, you know, his songs were too soulful and, you know, his voice was just too powerful for any pop songs. So they started to lose faith in Gerald and it's kind of sent him into like a depression, man. And they said he, he started to put on a whole lot of weight. He was looking bad, just feeling bad. And I seen interviews with his dad and I can tell that he kind of had regret in his voice about exposing Gerald to the music industry, man, because it really started to, to wear on him, you know, but eventually Gerald got his spirits up. 
and he wanted to lose weight. He wanted to get in shape, start feeling better. So he went to a weight loss camp. But during a game of volleyball while at this camp, he ended up tearing his ACL, man. And he, he was out. He was out bad. And, you know, of course, when you when you uh, have an injury like that, they're going to give you different prescription drugs, different painkillers. So that's what Gerald was doing. But instead of uh, maybe just taking a step back from music and just relaxing, what Gerald decided to do was come back earlier than he should have to get back on the road to make money. Because by this time, Gerald, he's the breadwinner of the family. You know, and according to his children, he was a very generous person. Like he was literally given to everybody, paying people's rent, cell phone bills, buying people's cars, giving people money, just pretty much. He just had a lot of people on his line. He had 21 people in his entourage and he just had a lot of pressure on him. So he felt pressure to get back on the road to make money, even if it was at the expense of his own health. But unfortunately, on November 10th, 2006, Gerald Levert was found dead in his bed by one of his cousins. And he had died from a combination of prescription drugs and over-the-counter drugs. According to his daughters, he would take a lot of Advil, a lot of like ambient pills because he had an insomnia real bad. So he would always need help going to sleep. They said he would drink NyQuil a lot. And I think just he just had bad luck one day, man. And unfortunately, it cost him his life. And it cost us the life of one of the greatest R&B soul legends that there ever was. And it, it tore his dad up, man. Eddie, him, him and Eddie, they, they were real close. And I fit, like I said previously, I think that his dad really felt bad about thinking that maybe it was his fault because of him exposing Gerald to the music industry, even though it wasn't his fault. I think he couldn't help but feel that way. So it crushed him. You know, Gerald Levert was 40 years old when he died, man. That is so sad. You know, and all that Eddie was going through and, and Gerald's mom, his mom, Martha, as well. You know, they were going through a lot losing Gerald. But unfortunately, the pain, the pain wasn't over because in the year 2008, their son, Sean Levert, was sentenced to 22 months in prison for failure to pay child support. But while he was being held in the Cleveland, Ohio jail, he passed away, man. He passed away due to negligence of the officers he suffered from anxiety he needed his medication he was trying to tell the guards that that's what he needed or you know his health was going to deteriorate but according to the guards they felt like he was trying to be disruptive or he was joking with them or something so instead of giving this man his medication that he needed to survive they decided to do this Man, that's crazy, man. I, I can't believe they let that man die like that. But there was some positivity that came from that situation. In the state of Ohio, they ended up passing a law called Sean's Law. And basically what it is, is to ensure that all inmates receive their required medications. But that still don't take the pain away from his mom and dad, you know. Especially since they had just lost Gerald not too long before him. And I just basically wanted to cover Gerald Levert's life because I feel like he is a very underrated R&B legend. And I was glad to see that TV One did an unsung on him. Y'all should go check that out. And uh, one more thing that he received is all his life he was chasing that Grammy. And in 2008, Gerald Levert actually did win a Grammy Award for his album In My Songs. I wish he could have been here to receive it in a physical form, but he still received it nonetheless. And Gerald LeVert will always be remembered. And he was only 40 years old when he died, man. Rest in peace, King.